Good morning. No, I said good morning. <laughs> good to see everybody. Glad to, to be on time side of life. Okay, firstly, this uh, service will be recorded. Not sh I'm not sure if they worked that out yet, but it's trying. We're trying to work that out so it can be recorded on YouTube for the members who were not able to be here. And hopefully it, uh, by now everyone has secured uh, communion packets. If not, you can uh, raise your hand and we can get that to you. Just a reminder, um, if you need communion packets, they are in the carport there. Um, you're welcome to help yourself to them. And if you're not able, to get those, you can let uh, either myself or one of the elders know we can get those to you um, as well. A reminder about our Wednesday night um, Bible study at 7 p.m. Uh, there's a link on the website. All are encouraged um, to participate in that study. Also, Sunday school um, is back at 9 a.m. Um, again, we always encourage you all to participate in that. Those who uh, miss Sunday school, um, again, you missed a, a good one, good lesson by Brother Brian today. Um, and because of the surge of COVID cases in Michigan, the CDC is recommending wearing uh, masks indoors, uh, indoor gatherings, regardless of your vaccination status. Um, and we do have masks available in the back if you do not um, have a mask. In our prayers this morning, see uh, Michaela Williams is back and she's recovering. Um, she's feeling much better and we're, we're, we're thankful for that. Um, good to see you, Michaela. Bob is asking prayers for his Uncle James and Aunt Wilma. Ellis, they both suffered recent falls. We want to please keep uh, them in your prayers. Sister Sandy Hummerson is also um, requesting prayers. She's on medication for a blood clot in her lung. Please continue to pray for her. Also a message from uh, Sister Julie. Pete D'Angelo is home uh, recovering and she wants to thank the congregation for praying uh, for him. So please keep him in your prayers. Also, we handed out um, gift cards for Thanksgiving. And if you would like to, you can still donate toward um, that work. Um, and that is all the announcements that I have at this time. Um, if you do have an announcement that you want um, announced, information that you want to announce, please get with myself or uh, one of the elders. We can make sure that we get that message out. Please, at this time, silence all of your electronic devices so that our service can go uh, uninterrupted. And let us go to God in prayer. Precious Father in heaven, we come to you just now with bowed heads and humbled hearts, and we thank you, dear God, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that you have given us this day, dear God, to work out our soul salvation, to come to this place this first day of the week and collectively worship with the saints, dear God. We're asking that you would uh, be with those who may not, may be on their way here, Father, that they can make it here safely to participate in this service um, as well. Father God, be with um, all of us, be with our brother Bryant, who will shortly come before us to break unto us the bread of life. Dear God, we pray that you would be with us in every song, every prayer, and everything that we do, dear God, just now would be to your honor and to your glory. Heavenly Father, we pray um, that we would continue to grow in your knowledge and understanding, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that we would set aside anything that would distract us and prevent us from giving our all to you. 
This is our prayer that we ask in the glorious name of our Lord, Savior, and Master. The church say amen. Good morning. Um, the first song we'll be singing is hymn number 130. Hymn number 130. from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 21 through 29. Matthew 7, 21 through 29. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rains fell, the floods came. And the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on rock. 
And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he had taught them as one having authority, not as their scribes. Let's go to God in prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for all that you've blessed us with. We thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning, Lord, to worship you and sing songs of praises to your name, Lord. We ask you to be with our brother Brian as he brings us the lesson this morning. We ask you to be with us that we can have an open and receptive heart, that we can listen to the message this morning and and do our best to live it throughout this week, Lord. We ask you to be with all those who were mentioned in the announcements earlier, Lord. We are thankful for Michaela's return to health. We're thankful for her being back with us this morning and restoring her health, Lord. We're prayerful for our sister Sandy, that she can be attended to by the doctors and that you could be with both her and Dave as they go through this trial, Lord. And and we ask you to just restore her to her full health, Lord. We ask you to be with my Uncle James and Aunt Wilma as they've suffered falls. We ask you to be with them, Lord, and comfort them and give them the strength back that that they would have, Lord. We ask you to be with our sister Julie's friend that that you will attend to, that you will be with uh, the doctors and nurses and friends attending to him, and that you will be with her as she as she attends to him as well, Lord. We ask you to be with us all again as we go through this worship service that we can do so in a manner that's well-pleasing to you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. To prepare our hearts and minds for the Lord's Supper, uh, please turn with me to hymn number 432. number 432. Oh, we'll be singing the first and third verse. First and third verse. If you have it, let us sing. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Yeah. 
So many times in our lives, timing is everything, right? We, uh, we've all had times that just another split second means a lot. I was sitting at a light one time and uh, when that light changed, I hit the gas and my old truck stalled. But the guy next to me didn't. He took off pretty quickly. And somebody ran the red light at Connor and Gratiot and just took that guy out. Timing, a lot of times, timing is everything. The Lord said, not this time, <laughs> for me, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says there's a time for everything, a time for everything under heaven. It's an awesome passage. It's a beautiful passage, Ecclesiastes 3. But what I want you to look at with me this morning is Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, starting with verse 6. For while we were still helpless... At the right time, the Bible says, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. I love that verse, verse 6, where it says, at the right time. Sometimes we skip over that. Sometimes we don't pay attention to that. But the fact is, exactly at the right time, Christ died for us. We have this awesome opportunity to gather around this table and commune with our Lord. Let's, let's open up our packets and expose the bread. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful, dear Lord, for this time that we have to gather around this table, this awesome opportunity we have to commune with you through your Son. We pray, dear Lord, as we partake of this bread, that we will focus on the body that it represents, the sacrifice that it represents, the love that it represents, dear Lord, the perfect timing that is your timing, dear Lord. We pray that we will put away all worldly thoughts and focus on these things, dear Lord. We pray that we will take this bread in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would peel back the second layer, exposing the cup. Pray with me once again. Dear Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks, dear Lord, for this fruit of the vine. We pray that as we partake of this cup, dear Lord, we'll understand that your son's blood shed on Calvary washes us clean daily, dear Lord. We pray that we will Take this cup in a manner well-pleasing in your sight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, as a time of convenience, we also have this opportunity to give back as we've been prospered. 
the, uh, whether you choose to use PayPal if you're at home, if you choose to set it aside for when you are here, or if you choose to mail it in, now is the time that we give together. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful, dear Lord, for all the many blessings you give us each and every day. We're thankful, dear Lord, for our jobs, for the privilege, the opportunity to earn a living, dear Lord. We are thankful for the material things you provide for us. We realize, dear Lord, that everything we have, you have provided for us, dear Lord. We pray that you will guide our minds, guide our hearts as we give back, and we pray that you'll guide those who oversee these funds that they'll be used in a way that will bring glory unto your name. These things we pray, dear Lord, in your son Jesus' name. Please mark your song books to number 588. Song of, song of invitation will be hymn number 588. And song before the today's lesson will be hymn number six.
say good morning to you. Good morning. And, and express how great it is to see everyone today and how great it is to be here among the saints, uh, given the opportunity to worship our Heavenly Father together in spirit and in truth. We are truly blessed because we are in Christ and it is indeed a wonderful, wonderful thing to, to be a Christian and to be a child of God. And it should uh, impact, of course, not only the way that we live, but also our attitude. And, and this morning we um, should be thankful and grateful uh, to God that he's given us the opportunity to worship him. Um, and our attitude uh, ought to reflect that um, and the spirit um, that we have ought to reflect that. This morning, I want to talk to you on the subject, who are the evildoers? Who are the evildoers? I want to ask if you would to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Before we go to God in prayer, let's read this together. Matthew chapter 7. Beginning with verse 21, we're going to read to verse 29. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Let's go to God in prayer. God and Father, we do thank you and we praise you for everything you've given to us and everything you've done. We thank you for your son, Jesus, our savior. And as we prepare to hear from you and to feast on your word, we pray that our minds are, are focused and our hearts are receptive and that we're learning, Lord, uh, the value, Lord, of that your word has in our lives. We're praying that and asking that we're learning the value of meekness, Lord, and by faith we're believing the promise that is in the inspired word that, um, that if we humble ourselves and that if we are meek, we are able to receive your word, which has the ability to save our souls. We pray that also by faith we're learning the value of looking past the speaker with his weaknesses and his shortcomings, Lord, and looking to you knowing that everything that is good and right and eternal and true belong to you and all the mistakes belong to the speaker. Won't you please bless us and, and help us, Lord, to, to grow in your word, Lord, and to have the desire to do so, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. The Sermon on the Mount, which begins, as we probably all know, begins in uh, Matthew chapter five, verse number one. Really, the thought um, that we should take into studying the Sermon on the Mount 
really begins in, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and following because the Bible describes how Jesus begins to teach about the kingdom. And so when we think about the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we ought to think about it as a message that begins with Jesus teaching about the kingdom and kingdom things. We ought to think about the Sermon on the Mount as a sermon in which Jesus speaks really on a host of subjects, on a host of, of matters, whether it's about uh, judging, whether it's about uh, what we know as the Beatitudes and the, the right mindset and how we ought to look at life in and, and really many ways in a contrary way to what the world t teaches us. When we, Jesus talks about uh, retaliation and just a host of things, we see this all in the Sermon on the Mount, in this teaching, and they are uh, things that we ought to understand are teachings that are in accordance to and that have to do with uh, the kingdom, instructing those Jesus does who would follow him about what it means and what it takes to be a part of the kingdom. As Jesus begins to conclude this message, and when we look at chapter 7, especially the latter verses, the concluding verses of, of chapter 7, uh, especially the verses that we just read, um, Jesus describes the difficulty involved in being a part of this kingdom. And that's really what we in part ought to understand, that Jesus is, is implying that it's not easy being a disciple of his because much of what he teaches to enter into the kingdom, to be a part of his kingdom, is contrary not only to what the world teaches, not only contrary to what the world believes, but contrary to what uh, and how we have lived most of our lives. And so Jesus tells us that these things that he teaches, that they uh, can be difficult for humans, but of course nothing is impossible with the Lord. And the blessings for those Jesus talks about there are blessings for those who who. Uh, obey his word and who remain in his word. Very, uh, again, similar to words that we see in the epistle of John where John says in his second epistle, verse nine, about the importance of abiding in the doctrine. That's really what these closing verses are really all about. Abiding in the dark doctrine and the blessings from abiding in the word of the Lord Jesus. Verses 15 through 20 consist of the Lord's teaching concerning what is the greatest threat to finding and recognizing the true kingdom. He teaches, talks about false prophets and wolves in sheep's clothing. And, and then because of this, therefore, Jesus warns those that would follow him to listen only to him. So important. Jesus says to listen only to him and only to his word and then act upon it. Notice that Jesus says, listen to his words. Be hearers and those who also what? who act upon his words. Jesus says that there will be many, many that lead others away from listening to him, that attempt to do this, and many that will deceive other folk from listening to the Lord in order that they may follow them. But those that choose life, Jesus says those who would, would have life, and that would experience eternal life, would choose his word, and not only choose to listen to his word, but to what? To be doers of his word. And when you look at the words that Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount, they're really not complicated. And I've heard it said many times over and over that, that there will be folk that will be surprised, but, and that may be so, but again, when you look at what Jesus is saying, the, the, the surprise is really only because they allowed men to deceive them. Now again, look at what Jesus says and how he puts it. Look at verse 24. Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. Choices that are made. The rain failed, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. Now look at verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine, see these individuals, they also hear the words. They also have the opportunity to listen to the pure and true teaching of the Lord Jesus. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine, there's a choice that is made by these individuals because they choose not to act on them. There's a choice that is there. He likens them to a foolish man who built his house on sand 
the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was its fall. What is the message that Jesus teaches? To hear his words and to, to be obedient from the heart to his words. And so this morning, this message, like the message that Jesus gave 2,000 years ago, is a very simple one. Who are the evildoers? In essence, it's just those who, who won't listen to the Lord's words and who don't act upon his words. See, and, and I want this morning, in our short time together, I want us to understand and to consider that there are various ways that one can be considered an evildoer. In other words, one who is lawless, one who is a worker of iniquity, one who refuses to do the will of the Lord Jesus. And so I want to present to you three things to consider, three different type of people to consider from the words of the Lord Jesus. First, consider that Jesus is referring to and Jesus is describing the individuals that fashion and create their own Jesus. Jesus is describing individuals that fashion, that mold and shape and create not the Jesus that we see in Scripture, not the, the, our Lord and our Master, but they create and they fashion their own Jesus. We're talking about those not interested, and Jesus describes as not interested in obeying the doctrine in the way that the Lord Jesus commanded, and in the way that he intended for all of us to obey his word, to see him and to regard him as our Lord and our Master, and to hear his words and to be obedient to his words from the heart. These individuals that Jesus describes, they don't look at the Lord's word in this manner. For these people, the commandments are seen through their worldview. There are individuals who see the Lord's word. They look at what you and I look at, and we see it, and we, we examine it in its truth and in its power and its life-giving nature, and, and we obey it. We ought to obey it. But then there are individuals that when they look at the Lord's word, they already have the mindset that they're going to see God's word through their worldview, through their world, through the way that they interpret Scripture, because they are individuals who fashion Jesus to be what they want Jesus to be. And so even though they refer to Jesus, and Jesus says it, they, they call him Lord, Lord, and they pretend to call on him, the reality is, is that it's impossible for them to do the things commanded by the Lord Jesus when they have already attempted to not have him rule over them, but they have what? Attempted to rule over the Lord Jesus. They fashion Jesus to be what they want him to be. It's impossible for these individuals to hear his true words and to act on them when they, through their attempts to fashion their own personal Jesus, to create their own personal Jesus, not the Jesus of the scriptures, then they do what? They elevate themselves acting as his Lord and not making him the Lord of their life. This is why Jesus will say to them, and this is what Jesus is talking about here, when he says to them, I never knew you. You workers of iniquity, go away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. This is why he makes this statement. Because even though they do things that could be considered good, and, and please hear me. Jesus is, is, is implying that they are able to do things that are good. And they practiced some of the words that were spoken by the Lord Jesus. But the truth is they only obeyed the words that they, choose, that they chose to obey. They only obey what they want to obey. And in doing so, they make Jesus out to be what they want him to be. They only do things that they believe are, are worthy and things that are valuable to them. They only do good to those that they believe are worthy and are virtuous. They are like the priest and the Levite in the Lord's parable about, when Jesus talks about the parable of what we call the Good Samaritan, Jesus describes two other men that come before the Good Samaritan, the priest and the Levite. We look at this passage of scripture and we see that these men obviously knew God's law. They knew God's word and they practiced aspects of it. But we can see clearly as Jesus describes them that they did not obey the parts of God's word that they did not want to obey. They ignored those things that challenged them and any aspect of God's word that they did not want to adhere to, they chose for themselves what they wanted to obey. And this is what Jesus is describing. And this happens when folk fashion 
Jesus to be what they want Jesus to be. You know, there are some religious people, and, and I've seen it many times over. You, you, you can talk to people, and you can hear them, and there are religious people who will send money to hungry children across an ocean, or they'll send money across the sea because they see this as a good work, and they'll even travel to these countries themselves, but will pass by hungry people right in their path because they deem them unworthy and unacceptable. There are folk right here in this country that are hungry, but to some folk, they are unworthy, and they don't deserve their monies or their energies and their efforts, and so they'll send their efforts and their monies across the sea, ignoring what the Lord says about folk that are around us and who we ought to deem as our neighbor. Jesus talks about folk, and he includes these type of folk in his words about evildoers, individuals who who pick and choose what part of God's word they will accept and what they will obey. Jesus describes individuals that claim to obey him. They call him Lord, Lord, and they, they act as if they, that he reigns over their lives and they claim to do his will, but in reality they don't act upon his word. There are aspects of his word that they, they want simply no part of. See, listen to me. Accepting some of his words while intentionally marginalizing other words of Jesus is equal to doing what? Disobeying all of his word. Let me say that again. See, when we say that, that this is acceptable and this is worthy of obeying, but then we marginalize any other aspects of the words that come from our Lord and our master, in essence, what we're doing is that we are disobeying all of it. We're disobeying every word of it. And so men fashion a, a Jesus that is in their own image. They don't want the Jesus that we find in the scriptures. They don't want Jesus to be their Lord and Master. Some fashion, number one, a Jesus that doesn't care about things that they see as unimportant. See, they see something that that's not as important. I know that the Bible says this, and I know that the scriptures, they, they, the scriptures talk about this, and it talks about this over and over, but that's really, that's an insignificant aspect of God's word. And so they believe that whatever they see as insignificant, that Jesus sees it as insignificant because they fashion not, they don't look at the Jesus of the Bible, they fashion their own Jesus. They're religious folk that do that. They fashion a Jesus that doesn't care about things that they see, that they deem as unimportant. And folk that they see as insignificant, Jesus really doesn't care about those folk. They don't care about their life or their livelihood. This is what we see from those that attend religious bodies. When we look at folk that are a part of, of religious bodies that are not in accordance to God's word and, and churches that, that we often de deem as denominations and, and churches that folk choose where they choose for themselves. This is because in their minds, for many people, they fashion a Jesus that doesn't care about how we worship. That Jesus doesn't care whether we have music or whether we, we, we have a, of praise, dancing, or Jesus doesn't care if we meet on Saturday. He really doesn't care about those things. And so they fashion a Jesus that is, is likened to them and what they see as important and what they see as unimportant. And so they look at scripture that you say, this is God's word and it's all important, but in, in their eyes, from their worldview, from their perspective, it's not important. So therefore Jesus, the Jesus that I have fashioned, doesn't think that that's important. What would make individuals when they see the New Testament scriptures describe how we ought to worship, when we ought to worship, how we ought to worship, what true worship is, what would make men create and devise their own methods of worship if it's not men that have fashioned their own Jesus Christ? It's what we see when we, when we talk about individuals like this. But Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the one that these folk claim to, to call on, but in reality, they don't think that it's important. They look at, 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 at things. Yeah, I know the Bible says that. I know that it teaches that, but that's not what Jesus meant by that. And even if he meant that, that's not that important. Jesus is not going to send people to hell based upon how they worship. And, and if a person, if, 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 a, if a church has, has women as, as, as leaders, the Lord doesn't care about those particular things. But Jesus says to all of us that would follow him that we ought to do what? That we ought to be obedient to every word. To be obedient to every word. And then there are those who 
who have fashioned a Jesus that only cares about the things that are important to them. There are those who fashion a Jesus that doesn't care about those things that they don't care about, but then there are those who fashion a Jesus that only cares about the things that they care about, that are important to them. And through their worldview, that's the Jesus that they see when they see the scriptures. This is what you and I see and that what we have witnessed recently in our times from religious nationalists and people that are like this, as well as those who only care about social justice and equality. See, those things that we see in scripture, all of it is God's word, all of it. But we can't look and say, well, because this is what is important to me and because this is what I believe that life is all about, then therefore this is the Jesus that I will fashion. See, that's not the Jesus that we see in the scriptures. We ought to follow and listen to and adhere to all of his words. There are folk, and we've seen it recently, who, who deem themselves as, as Christians and as nationalists and, and patriots, and so what is important to them, they think that those are the things that Jesus cares about. They think that Jesus cares as much about the Constitution as he does his word. But brothers and sisters, there is no comparison when it comes to the Lord. There is one that we ought to adhere to and one that is written by men. And just because we think that something is important, we, we have to understand that we have to check with our Lord and our Master, if he's truly our Lord and our Master, to find out what the Lord says is important. There are some folk who believe that because the Constitution says that we have a right to bear arms, that Jesus himself must carry, or that if he was in the world today, he would carry a firearm. There are folk who believe that. And so they, through their worldview, they have a Jesus that is fashioned through their worldview. And then there are those who see Jesus as a social warrior, a, a, a person who is striving to make everything right in this world. And that's, again, based upon their worldview. What we have to remember is that Jesus, the Lord of the Bible, is the one that we must seek. Some believe in the Jesus that loves one group and stands with one side while opposing and abhorring the other. That's what they think. Well, he loves us and he's on our side, but he hates and he abhors all of those who don't believe the way that we do. Because after all, if Jesus were here today, he would believe everything that we believe. But that's not the way that it works. We ought to believe what he has commanded us to believe. And we ought to act in the manner in which he has commanded us to act, not fashion Jesus to be what we want him to be. See, they only hear these folk that Jesus describes here, only hear words of Jesus that they believe support their worldview. They pick and they comb through the scriptures like the Pharisees did. They comb through the scriptures and they find words that they believe support their worldview. And they say, here, that proves it. This is what Jesus taught. This is what Jesus believes in. But you have to take all of what the word of the Lord says and be obedient to, to all of it. Therefore, the words of the Lord that these folk obey are the words that they are in line with their worldview. This is why it is so obvious to everyone. You ever see those folk? who believe so much as that they're Christians and that they are right, and you can see, without even judging them, that obviously that they are missing the mark because they're only picking and choosing what they choose to adhere to and believe and to obey. We shouldn't be on sides, but we ought to be on the Lord's side and in tune with his word. We ought to consider individuals like this that Jesus describes, individuals who attempt to fashion Jesus to be the Lord that they want him to be. And then next, we ought to consider that Jesus is referring to individuals that act presumptuously. We ought to consider that included in the words of the Lord Jesus, the many that Jesus is describing here, he's in describing individuals that act presumptuously and assume that they know better than Jesus. Get that. Mere men can reach a, a certain level of arrogance that we actually believe that we know more than the Lord Jesus knows. See, these individuals are a part of the many that Jesus describes in verse 22. That on that day, they will exclaim, Lord, Lord, they will say it, Lord, Lord. And the Lord says, 
and they, they understand that they are about to be eternally separated from him, they will say, Lord, Lord, are you going to send us to hell? Lord, Lord, remember that all of the things that we did in your name. And Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Because when it came to my word, you assumed that you knew more than me and you acted presumptuously. My word said this, and you acted as if doing what you wanted to do was better than what my word said. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. See, the reason why Jesus will say these words, depart, go away, I never knew you, is because these individuals, they refuse to humble themselves to God's word. They refuse to do so. A true servant walks meekly before the master. When we talk about, see, the whole concept of calling Jesus Lord and, and saying, Lord, Lord, we are acknowledging that he has rule and reign over our lives. That we are not the ones to, to direct him, but that we are open and that we are ready to receive his direction. And we're ready to be obedient and act upon his words. That's what we, we mean when we call him Lord. A true servant walks meekly before his or her master, his or her Lord. They don't act as though they know better. You ever have your children? You know, we're not talking about technical stuff. Growing up, you know, we had our children who at times, probably it didn't matter what age, that there was a time probably that every one of our children thought that they knew more than we did and tried to explain certain aspects of life to us, even though our experience dictate that we were the ones who had wisdom and the fact that we brought our children to the world. Isn't it foolish when our children growing up think that they can tell us something about life that they have not experienced in the manner in which we've experienced it? Even more foolish than that is for a human being, one that God has created and fashioned, the one who, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 4, where God knows everything about us, inwardly and outwardly, and in every way, for us to assume that we know more than him at any time is really a foolish concept and a foolish notion. We ought to understand that he has the ability and the right, the power, and the knowledge to be our Lord and our Master. Jesus talks about those who act presumptuously and assume that they know more. Among these people are those that read passages like Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where the Bible says, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone that has faith, to the Jew first and to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous shall live by faith power of the gospel. Paul talks about the things concerning the purpose and the power of the gospel in that passage. He says that the gospel is God's power. And yet, there are religious people that claim to preach the gospel. They claim to believe that gospel. They claim to love that gospel. They claim to believe that that gospel saves men, but actually attempt to draw men by earthly means and by worldly attractions. You ever see folk like that? You ever see religious places like that where folks say, I, I know that what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that the gospel is the power for all men to be saved, that, that no man can be saved apart from the gospel of Christ, but yet... We believe that we're going to attract folk if we do this. That's man presuming that he knows more than the Lord who died on the cross for all of men. Isn't it arrogant for someone, for some human being, a mere man or a woman to think that they know better than God? And a lot of things to us may not make sense, but if God said it, as Christians, we ought to believe it by faith. We ought to accept it. Whether we agree with it, whether the world teaches things differently or not, we ought to believe that God's way is always better than our way. In fact, God's way is the only way we ought to have that attitude. We ought to have that mindset. These folk read the apostles' words in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, where Paul says that there is no foundation to be laid except Christ Jesus. And yet they say, but there are other things that we can do to draw folk. And they will have stadiums, stadiums and stadiums of people. 
then the question must be asked, are they saved by the gospel of Christ Jesus? Because there is no other way. There is no other way. Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. See, some claim to have as their foundation and as their base of their teaching the Lord. They say, oh, we believe in Jesus. We believe in his teaching. We have him as our foundation. But in reality, because their desire is to please men, they will do whatever it takes to draw men to themselves. They draw men to them, but they don't draw. The Lord is not drawing men in that fashion and in that manner. And among those same people, among these many, are those that walk in the church, even in the Lord's church, because we're not exempt. There are individuals that know the words that Jesus has spoken concerning the work of the church. We see passages like Ephesians chapter 4. We see passages like Ephesians chapter 3 where Paul talks about what his purpose as an apostle was and how he was a part of delivering the word of God to the saints and how the word is purposed to do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And yet we read these words and we still, as we said this morning, we believe that the only responsibility that we have to the church is to be there on Sunday. We're no different than folk that we claim are wrong in denominations when we have that attitude. We have to look at all of his word because the same Jesus that gave Paul the words in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 is the same Jesus that gave Paul the words to Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians in chapter 1 where Paul talks about this glorious blessing and the inheritance that is waiting for us but how we ought to walk worthy of the calling in order to receive those blessings. Same Lord said all of it. We ought to obey all of it. Adhere to all of it by faith. See, we know in the Lord's church what he talks about in terms of the work of the church, how it's important for us to edify one another. But when we hear those words, we think that the preacher's peak, picking on us or that the elders are picking on us. And no, they're not Brian's words. They're not Bob and Vince's words. They're still the words of the one that we all call our Lord and our Master. They're his words. And I am no different, brothers and sisters, if I say, okay, well, you know what? Only thing that matters is that we love each other and that all of us come on the first day of the week. It doesn't really matter if we don't grow numerically, if we don't grow and if we don't mature, as long as what we have here, as long as we just stay a tight group, we have to ask ourselves, is that what Jesus said? Is that what he said? Or is the purpose for this, in part, for equipping the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body? Isn't that the purpose? Isn't that found? Didn't Jesus say that? Didn't Jesus say that? See, we have to look at ourselves even in the Lord's church. See, there are folk, again, and again, if, if it's not pertaining to you, it doesn't pertain to you, but I know, I've been a member of the Lord's church for 35, 36 years, and I know that there are folk that are not interested in edifying and building up the body, and so they assume that they have a better purpose for our gathering. That can't be the reason why we are supposed to gather, but that's what the Bible says. That's what the Lord says is part of our gathering. For us to be built up. For us to be built up by the words that he's given to you. To us, folk that have no interest in carrying the gospel light into the world. Think about that. We talked about how it's indicative and it's the nature of a disciple of the Lord Jesus to make sacrifice. Well, it's also the nature of a true Christian to do what? To, to be a light and to spread the gospel into the world. That shouldn't even be something that we exhort you in uh, on a routine and a regular basis, that ought to be something that when we mature, that we do and that we grow in and that is a part of who we are. We have, many times we have lost that part of what Jesus has taught. But the same, again, when we look at the words of Jesus, we see Jesus instructing in Matthew 28, verses 16 and following the apostles. We should not say, well, that was to the apostles. He wasn't telling us to go, therefore. 
Jesus was talking to them specifically. Well, then we have to look at the words of the apostles themselves and the example of the apostles themselves. We have to look at the apostle Paul when he says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, follow me as I follow Christ. When Paul talks about handing down to the first century church the traditions that was, was given to him by inspiration, those words are meant for us today in the 21st century as well. And part of that instruction is that we go, therefore, and be a light and proclaim the gospel light in the dark places of the world to a lost world. And so assuming that there are other ways to convert men. See, we, we have a lot of, of churches of Christ, so-called churches of Christ as well, that have left their purpose and the plan of God. And what do they do? They are becoming like folk in the world. And they say, well, if we do this and if we do that, then we will bring people. We have to make it fun for people. The gospel is too mundane. If the gospel, people have heard it over and over and over again. We need to spice things up. But the same gospel that Paul said 2,000 years ago is the power to save men. God still uses that same power and only that power to save men. We ought to stick with what Jesus said. Just stick with what he said. See, these are among the many that Jesus describes as evildoers and referred to as evildoers, those who assume that they know better than God. And then finally, I'll be quick. Consider that Jesus is referring to individuals that give up on the words of Jesus. He's referring to those that give up on his words. See, the reason why Jesus will say, depart from me to some, go away, you workers of iniquity, you evildoers. The reason why he will say that, that I never knew you, is because the individual stopped trusting in him. There are folk who will say on that day, Lord, Lord, remember, I did a lot of good things in you, for you. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. We cannot say to Jesus, if Janet Jackson didn't allow for somebody, and she said, what have you done for me lately? What makes us think that we can say about our past and hold it up to Jesus and say, Lord, remember what I used to do for you? Remember how I used to be obedient to your word, Lord? Remember how when you would say something that I, I ran with zeal and hunger to do your word? Jesus will say to those who have given up on his word, on that day, depart from me. I never knew you. See, a true servant, Again, a true servant believes in every word of the master and they patiently endure hardships. And it's difficult in this life. Preachers, elders, leaders in the church, those who are supposed to lead us, we sometimes, we, we, we suffer persecution and we, we suffer hardship and sometimes those hardships make us fall to our knees. And sometimes we, we are not the men that we're supposed to be. Mothers and fathers, as much as they're supposed to be strong and a light to a family, sometimes being a Christian and walking this Christian journey, we fall on our knees. But all at the end of it all, we, we have to get back up. We have to say that I know his word is right. I know his word has the ability to save. And I want to be like the wise man that builds my entire life on his word because when those times come, I want to be ready to endure them and the next time that something that has blown me over comes, I, I want to be strong enough to endure because I want to hear his words say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. But those who start off obediently and give in and give up because of hardship, because of anything that's in this life, they are likened to those whom Jesus never knew, whom Jesus never knew. Jesus will say to them as well, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. Remember Jesus gave the parable about individuals who on that day will say, remember I used to see you in the marketplace. I used to hear your teaching in the marketplace. Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. All of those Pharisees that on that day that says, we, we, I saw you every day. Remember, I can even tell you, Jesus, where you used to go and how you used to teach. I can even tell you some of the words that you taught. Jesus is going to say, depart from me. You evildoer, I never knew you. We have to obey his word and we have to remain and abide in his word. Sad day, sad words. Jesus is going to say that according to the word to many. In fact, Jesus is not even really referring to folk 
that don't pay him any mind. He's talking to religious people. Most religious people will hear those words, depart from me, you workers of need. That's why Jesus says to do what? Narrow path, straight gate, because broad is the way. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Most religious people will hear those unfortunate words. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to, to, to think that on that day, I don't know what the Lord will say. How do I know that I will hear well done, good and faithful servant, hear his word, remain in his word, obey his word from the heart? If you're here this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel itself, we want to urge you to obey through faith, repentance, confession, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and following. God promises upon your obedience to the gospel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that on that day when he receives his own to himself, that he will give you the crown of life that no man can take away, provided you walk faithfully unto death. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. And if you are a Christian, if you are a Christian and you need an attitude change, all of us go through that period. Brother Bob talked about, about the importance of time. And there will come a time, if it's not today, that all of us need an attitude change, even when it comes to God's word, because we're, we're flawed and we're selfish humans at times. We are arrogant humans at times. And some of the things that we talked about that Jesus implies, there are times when we, we fall to these things and we give ourselves over to these things. And maybe it's that period in your life where you haven't been obedient. But the time is today to change, to have a different attitude, and say that I'm going to, to do and be obedient to God's word and to all of his will. And God promises to give us the strength to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you are here and you're a Christian and you also need to come, come right now. All we all together stand up while we sing.
you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time so thankful for this time together, Father. Thankful for those who are here. Thankful for those who are worshiping with us in spirit. Father, we thank you so much for the family of believers that you've provided, Father, that you've bound us with your son's blood. We are so thankful to be able to join together and know that we are part of one body. Father, we thank you for the lesson that was brought today. Pray that we continue to examine it, to continue to examine ourselves, to see that we're doing all that we can, to see that you are our focus, Father. We ask you be with those who are mentioned in our prayers, mentioned in the announcements. Pray you be with each of us as we go through this life, Father. Pray you be with each of us as we go from here. That you keep us safe on our ways. Thank you for the, the beauty of this world, but we thank you above all for the beauty and perfection of your Son, Father. We thank you for an opportunity to be part of your family and part of your kingdom, Father. We thank you again for all those who served, for those who are joined in the family, Father. Thank you in Christ's name. Amen.